iGaming is truly becoming a global business. Europe, for instance, has become saturated and gaming companies are starting to look at other continents, particularly Asia, with a market of over 4 billion potential players. That means you, as an iGaming professional, have to attend shows across the globe, and not just in one continent. Old shows must make room for new shows in emerging markets. In this short video, we will outline why Sigma Malta, Sigma Latam, and Sigma Manila are worth investing in. Here's three main reasons. Reason one, emerging trends. When we started Sigma back in 2014, we strongly believed that Sigma must embrace all three verticals. Today's super affiliate, for instance, is fast becoming an operator, thanks to lower barriers to entry. Sigma is and will remain the only 360 degree show that brings the entire industry from C-level executive to super affiliates under one roof. Given also the significant presence of integrated resorts in Asia and Latam, moving forward, we've decided to include land-based gaming. Reason two, emerging hubs. Sigma is held in three iGaming hubs. Malta, the gaming hub in Europe. Manila, the undisputed hub in Asia and Sao Paulo, a region with vast potential. Reason three, emerging tech. Moving forward, we're merging two large expos under one roof. Our iGaming show Sigma, as well as our emerging tech summit AIBC, will take place at the same venue and on the same dates, breaking boundaries for the two verticals to learn and feed off each other. So what are you waiting for? Get in touch with us today and let's work together. Our three summits will open new doors for you. Welcome to Sigma. Welcome to the world's iGaming festival.
We have an important announcement to make. I am very excited to launch Sigma Latam. That's right, a third summit in Latin America that will complement Sigma in Europe and Sigma in Asia. Tenemos una fuerza laboral fuerte en Malta, en Kiev y en Manila. Es hora de que Sigma aumente nuestra cartera y se expenda más allá de nuestra zona de confort, cubriendo todas las horas horarias con las nuevas oficinas en las Américas. Las ciudades cotadas fueron Buenos Aires y São Paulo. Acabamos escolhendo la segunda por dos razones. Reason number one, there's always a great presence of media and events in offices in Buenos Aires, and we don't want to replicate more or the same or compete with our friends. Segunda, o grande potencial de mercado e a natural posibilidades de regulamentação de jogos no Brasil nos derram mais motivos para decidir estabelecer nosso escritório lá. Brazilian federal deputy Pompeo de Matos, for instance, believes casinos will be a vaccine for coronavirus, stating that tax and gaming money could jumpstart the country's economy in the wake of COVID-19. Ele machuca a economia. E eu diria assim, para nós, até ajudar a levantar a economia depois que passar a pandemia, uma das alternativas é, inclusive, legalizar os jogos. É uma alternativa perfeitamente possível, viável, eu diria assim, até necessária. Assuntos como este, dentre outros, para o parte dos nossos debates em setembro. Moving forward, we hope that our three pillar shows, Sigmund Malta, Sigmund Manila, and eventually Sigma and Sao Paulo will pave the way for our gaming communities to learn from as well as do business with each other. I look forward to contribute to this and make our gaming truly a global phenomenon.
five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to AIBC Summit Digital Conference. We're calling up for you from Malta. I'm Jessica Walker and I'm your host. And over the next four hours, we'll be bringing you content from all over the world discussing the latest developments in emerging tech, blockchain, cryptocurrencies and AI. It's set to be an amazing four hours with speakers from all over the world with a focus on the emerging developments across Asia. As you knew, we were due to have our Manila conference in June this month, but Due to COVID-19, we have had to make the move digital. But that being said, that does bring the amazing opportunity to bring you speakers today, such as Brock Pierce, Tim Draper, Justin Sun, and many, many more. So stay tuned and let's join the conversation. Uh -huh. Now, if you are viewing us on our website, on Facebook, or also on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us for our live show. I would like to direct you to our very own platform on swapcod.com. If you use the code SIGMA in all capital letters, you get to interact with delegates and other speakers and attendees, discuss, and also I'll be reading out some questions and some interactions live throughout the show, so be sure to head over there. Also, we'll be available on Twitter on AIBC Summit with the hashtag AIBC BC Digital. So get involved with the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. Now, a huge thank you to our sponsors, Chili's, for the amazing studio and also the sponsors of this next session and Richard, our director. <laughs> Let's get started with today. Keynote with Honorable Clayton Bartolo, Junior Minister for Financial Services and Digital Economy at the Government of Malta. I am humbled and honored to be welcoming you all to the AIBC Digital Summit, the first such digital summit which is being held under the current circumstances of the COVID-19. And having just assumed the office of Junior Minister for Financial Services and Digital Economy four months ago, we are being faced with a number of challenges. Challenges which have not deterred us from seeking our aims, such as that of consolidating what we already have in Malta. The digital economy part, which is growing even more in its importance as time goes by. This also means that we are looking for new niche sectors of our economy, so that we can continue strengthening our gross domestic product with the new economic areas which we are looking for. This means that we are also looking for innovation, Innovation both in terms of what we already have and also innovation in four new sectors where we are looking for new and innovative areas to expand. This also includes research and development, which are very important for our economy to continue increasing in its importance and also to continue attracting both talent as well as employment opportunities. We also have the financial services, which at the moment are facing also their challenges. And I do acknowledge that as a country, we have gone through a number of challenges. However, we are taking the necessary steps to address these challenges and turn them into opportunities for our country and for our institutions to enhance our due diligence and also to enhance our country's reputation, both on a local level as well as on an international level. This means that we will continue creating employment opportunities for our local people who are interested in seeking a career in financial services. As time goes by, technology and digitization are taking on an added importance. Take, for example, the fact that I am addressing thousands of you without being in the same location as all of you are. This means that together and through the use of technology, we can actually achieve more, both as a country as well as all of us involved in this new technological sector. Companies which have invested in technology over the past years will continue striving forward. And now is the time for more companies to add technology to their portfolio. It is very important that digitization becomes the heart 
of each decision which is taken. Every strategy from now on needs to be based on digital technologies and also on digital innovation. This is the way forward for every company which is looking to continue increase and expand its market share. The same applies to Malta, which as an island nation state is looking to continue enhancing and diversifying various economic sectors, such as quantum, high performance computing, big data. We are also realizing more the importance of cybersecurity and also blockchain, which is taking on an added importance. Artificial intelligence should also become part of our daily lives, together with Internet of Things and also digital innovation hubs, where we can see a number of startups which will be starting their entrepreneurial life in our economy. Then we also have the importance of esports and video game developments, two new up and coming areas where Malta is looking to be a first mover in these areas. Finally, I also encourage other governments to follow Malta's example and include digitization as part of their public sector strategy. This needs to be done in order to reduce bureaucracy and improve the client service which all the citizens of the countries deserve. This is a journey which we can all undertake together. I do look forward to further collaboration with all interested parties so that everyone can be a part of this success. A huge thank you to Clayton there for the Emerging Tech Update, taking a look at Malta. Now we're going to work our way around the world and see what's been built in 2020. And we're going to go now to one of our special guests that first joined us at our first AIBC Summit in 2018. He's joining us on the line all the way from Puerto Rico. We have Brock Pierce. Trust in Tech Keynote with Brock Pierce. Founder and Chairman at Integra Foundation. 2020 has been a challenging year for many. And so the question is, how has the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry developed you know, during this time as a result of all this? I like to refer to 2020 or this decade as the visionary 20s. You know, 2020 makes me think of sight, clear sight. And so uh, I'm excited by it. Obviously, you know, COVID-19 and other things have made this very challenging for you know, a lot of people. Certainly some people and some families have been radically or drastically impacted by this virus. We've lost friends and family. But for those of us that have made it this far, it's also presented an opportunity. And during this time of confinement, in this time of quarantine and social distancing, it's provided us with an opportunity to reflect on our lives, to take a look at our homes and to get our house in order. And I don't mean that just literally, I mean it figuratively. This has been an opportunity to take a look at everything in our lives. And it's given us an opportunity to reset or restart and to determine which things are serving us and what is not, you know, as they say, when given lemons, make lemonade. And so I hope that all of you have taken this opportunity to reflect, to better yourself. And so that we hopefully don't return to normal. Hopefully we create a better normal. And so our industry has been impacted like all industries. Clearly central banks around the world have been printing money in an unprecedented fashion. Markets have responded negatively, positively, still unclear which way things are going. Employment levels here in the United States, for example, are reaching Great Depression levels. Families, you know, probably as much as 70% of the American public, and I'm sure this is an issue similarly all over the world, are living in a state of fear, concerned about their futures their ability to pay their rent or their mortgages, simple things like just putting food on the table. And as difficult as this is, the main lesson or the main message I'd like to impart on everyone is to fear less and to love more. And so during these challenging times, technology is here and it has an opportunity to enhance our lives. Our industry, as I like to say, is providing us with a single source of truth. 
an immutable record that eliminates the ability for anyone to edit what's happened. And that history will no longer be written by the victors, but the facts will just be. And we don't normally know whether something is really good for us or bad for us until we have the benefit of hindsight. And so I pray and I hope that when we look back on this time, that it brought humanity great clarity and technologies such as ours have helped liberate humanity. And so as much as I'm concerned, I remain extremely hopeful and I hope that we are better for this. And so I live, I live in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, like all of the world, has been impacted by COVID-19. And as someone that works in the cryptocurrency industry that's focused on doing good things in the world and hopefully making a positive impact, you know, everywhere I go, I'm always seeking my brothers and sisters and people that have a similar passion in making the world a better place. And it's been a great honor to work with Binance and Binance Charity to do what we can as an industry to change the way that we're perceived. You know, our industry is often perceived by many as an industry focused on getting Lambos or getting rich. Uh, but we truly have the ability to make the world a better place. That is, I think, at the core of the philosophy of what our technology does. And so with Binance, the foundation that I've helped start and lead here in Puerto Rico, Integro, which in Espanol means integrity and integration. The idea being to integrate with integrity. And so we've partnered up uh, and raised or collected a million dollars to buy masks to deliver through Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and to deliver a million dollars worth of masks to our first responders. And so it's been a, a wonderful thing. Integro, in addition to the work with Binance, has also created the, the FeedPuertoRico.org campaign, which is to buy food from farmers to deliver it to the families and those people that are most in need, because people have been hungry. And so uh, I'm really proud of the work that the team at Integro has done to serve, at least in our small way, as many people as we possibly can. And so a lot of people from the blockchain or cryptocurrency industry have moved to Puerto Rico prior to Hurricane Maria and in large numbers post Hurricane Maria. And so we have the, call it the human capital. You know, those individuals that possess the intellectual capital, the social capital, in many cases, the financial capital, and in some cases, the spiritual capital to take this technology that has the potential to enhance lives of people here and everywhere. And I hope many of us are working to bring solutions to this island to solve critical problems around food security and making it sustainable and ultimately regenerative to build a resilient power grid that can sustain hurricanes and earthquakes and provide reliable power on a peer-to-peer -peer basis you know, the, potentially the implementation of cryptocurrencies or stable coins that can create a more equitable and transparent medium of exchange. And so, you know, if you're trying to decide where you can go and make a difference, just know that Puerto Rico is one of those places. Well, the challenge is, you know, I mean, as an industry, blockchain and cryptocurrency started out as an idea, right? Something really theoretical. And then you go from that to building prototypes. And from prototypes, you build minimally viable products. And I think our industry is just moving beyond the minimally viable product stage to something where mass sort of adoption can occur. And so I think 2020 is going to be the year that we begin to see that, though there are you know, some challenges when COVID caused the markets to crash. Cryptocurrency prices moved in line with public equity markets, which suggests that we don't have yet parallel systems. Those systems are still correlated and they rise and fall together. And hopefully as this parallel system, this parallel, call it rail, emerges and gains adoption, that it eventually uh, stands on its own two feet, you know, independent as a true alternative to call it the legacy systems as we build more efficient systems that ultimately serve all of us better. To see our, call it true or full potential is ultimately starts with building you know, the efficient bridges, roads, and tunnels that are safe, secure, and easy to use. 
And I think we're just entering that phase in our industry, so I'll call it development or evolution. And so I encourage all of us to, to build systems that are inclusive of everyone, that continue to be equitable, that stay true to the underlying philosophy of what we're attempting to build here. And so uh, I think we're at the beginning of that point. You know, as the Eagle, you know, in the, in the 1920s, they referred to those 20s as the Roaring 20s. Hopefully, as we move the, through this next century of 20s, that moving beyond Roaring to Soaring. And so hopefully, as an industry, we reach that true potential and help humanity to soar to its highest heights. Well, for many years, I've been traveling the world, meeting and greeting as many curious minds as I possibly can. And so that network is comprised of people from every walk in life, from many cultures and diverse backgrounds. But in terms of music and entertainment, yeah, I, I grew up in the entertainment industry. <laughs> I grew up making movies and I played a role in, in music and certainly consumed plenty of both. And so uh, friends like Akon, uh, I, I think credit me for having brought them in, but I don't think, uh, you know, hopefully the message that I share has helped many of us in our journey. And it doesn't matter whether I was the person that first introduced it to you, hopefully taking some of these, you know, call it complex ideas and distilling them down into simple sound bites or ideas that everyone can easily understand have helped many of you and hopefully many more recognize that this technology truly has the potential to make the world a better place. Well, a huge thank you to Brock there for that passionate keynote. Now we're going to take a look at our first panel discussion of the day, looking at what has been built in the blockchain supply chain sphere. But first, if you are watching us on Facebook or YouTube or our website, I would like to direct you to our own platform, swapcard.com. Use the code SIGMA, all capital letters. One of our team members will have put the description in the comments below on whatever platform you're viewing us on. We will have interactive polls and comments with our speakers and delegates. The next panel discussion actually has a poll asking you your opinion on the blockchain and tech sphere. So we'd love to see you get involved and read some of your comments live on the line. Now, our first panel discussion of the day is hosted and moderated by Rachel McIntosh from Finance Magnets. So let's take a look at what's being discussed. Supply chains and the spotlight. Has COVID-19 highlighted demand for automation? With Ben Gertzo. CEO at Singularity Net, Stefan Nielsen, CEO at Unisoft. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Rachel McIntosh. I'm a podcast host and a journalist for Finance Magnates, and welcome to our discussion today. I'm so pleased to have here with me two thought leaders from the blockchain and AI space. Uh, I'll have Ben Gertzel, who's the chief executive of Singularity Net, and Stefan Nielsen, who's the chief executive of Unisat. And I'll just ask them to briefly introduce themselves a little bit more uh, now, starting with Ben. Uh, I'm an artificial intelligence researcher for 30 plus years now. I have a PhD in math and for a long time I've been applying AI to pretty much every area you could think of, uh, finance, uh, health tech and biology, uh, robotics, uh, some some su supply chain and some AGI, artificial general intelligence, trying to make AI really be as, as smart as people. Since 2017, I've been running SingularityNet, which is a blockchain-based AI marketplace, and then using that as a platform for applying AI in all sorts of different areas, uh, some of which we'll be talking about today. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Ben. And I, I said before the call, but I say it again, I love your hat. <laughs> Stefan, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure, yes. So uh, I'm Stefan Nilsson. I'm the founder and CEO of CEO of Unisot, which is an enterprise blockchain platform. Uh, I'm also uh, the founder of a company called Seafood Chain, where we're actually implementing this platform from Unisot, so to uh, to help uh, the seafood supply chain. So I'm based in Norway, 
And the second biggest uh, export uh, industry here is seafood. Or maybe now with the, with the oil price going low, maybe it's the biggest one. I haven't checked the, the latest prices, but uh, so that's what I'm working with at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Thank you both so much for being here. So let's get right into it and with talking a little bit about manual work and automation. So as we know, supply chain interruptions have been a big part of the global disruptions caused uh, by COVID-19. So why at this present moment are supply chains so ineffective and so vulnerable to situations like the COVID crisis? What we see when we are talking to customers is that even today, 2020, uh, the, the digitalization level is, is very low, actually. Uh, a lot of mm. companies are still using uh, uh, Excel or, or Google Docs uh, to share documents or, or even down to, to okay. pen and paper to, to store temperatures and, and, and uh, all the transport documents for, in trucks and boats and so on are still paper-based. and. Uh, it's that so may crazy. and, and uh, yeah and a lot of that because they are they are paper based and manual based uh, they get hit very hard uh, if there is uh, situations now like this where people are not allowed to go to work or or they are simply they are simply sick and can cannot go to work then that that stops up the the, the processes and uh, what many people don't think about is that everything more or less is supply chain today so everything you buy your clothes your phone your computer or your your food not the least food comes from a supply chain which has all the all of these manual steps and mm -hmm. and also with the with the today's way of working with just in time delivery and so on we we also see that that company does not have any in a spare uh, warehouses or spare supply so when when the supply stops for some reason, the whole operation has to stop because there is there is no extra to 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 take from. Right, exactly. So clearly, there's a big problem. Yeah, Ben. Oh, I was gonna say you have you have multiple levels of of, of problem here, and yeah, he's absolutely mm. right. Like in terms of what we see in in Hong Kong, I mean, when you order something from an English language English language website based in 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 US made in China. You know that website may be put online by someone in, in Hong Kong, but you know how does this stuff get there? Often, someone in Hong Kong, you know, every week or two they make a trip physically across the border into into China. They they go to to some city in in remote China that they bring back. You know, it could be a bunch of suitcases or or, or a truck across across the border into Hong Kong, they put stuff in boxes in, in, in a warehouse in Hong Kong and and they mm -hmm. they ship it out, right? So for one thing, that border hasn't been, been operating for a while. I mean, Hong Kong has limited warehouse space. So you don't want to bother stuff too long there. It's 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 stored back in in China and brought over mm -hmm. as, as deep. And then in Hong Kong, while in some ways Hong Kong is super high tech, I mean Everything is paper is written down in, in, in Cantonese, right? And, and, and I mean, <laughs> Hong, Kong, Hong Kong hasn't had stay-at-home orders, so I mean, people people are going to the office in, in, in Hong Kong, but it's 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 not it's not business as usual. Not 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 everyone is going in, and and foreigners can't come in. Like if if you think about like something like twenty percent of the world's 20% of Africa's mobile phones came through one building, Chongqing Mansion in Hong Kong, and probably another 30 to 50% from Guangzhou in China. Well, now, now those guys with suitcases and mobile phones are, aren't going aren't going back and forth, let alone only recently <laughs> going to the factory in, in, in Guangzhou where the mobile phones were, 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 were made again, right? So yeah, you've got you've got very basic like low brow on the ground problems like people can't get from from a to b or things are sitting in the warehouse because the guy who has to stop, chop the floor is in the office because there's something so once you bypass those problems then you would get to the higher end problems right like once once things were digitized and once borders are are, are, are mostly open then then you, then you have more interesting problems 
It's like, okay, when one thing isn't working, can an automated system figure out how to, how to route around it? And often it probably could because the supply chains are very, very, you know, the, the, in electronics, for example, in South China, it's amazing how many suppliers there are and how many different ways there are to fulfill, to fulfill a certain need. So that, I mean, the raw, the raw capacity and diversity is certainly there for AI running on a blockchain to do amazing automated fulfillment and, you know, dynamically figure out the best route to get, to get what, what is needed along multiple chains. But we're seeing a breakdown of sort of very basic low, lower, lower level aspects of the, of the process, which uh, means we're not in most domain supply chain is not yet getting getting to the fun parts from a from an AI meets blockchain guy. Which is like how do you how do you use AI to more optimally, adaptively fulfill different supply chains based on on changing circumstances. Right, exactly. So, so then I'll, I'll ask uh, Stefan first. You know, what does a solution, uh, AI blockchain-based solution for for this kind of problem, which uh, you and Ben just so beautifully laid out, what does that look like on a practical level? So, so uh, when we talk about blockchain, we we talk about it's it's a distributed system that nobody owns, mm -hmm. and if you look at the supply chain, that that's the same thing. It's, it's a number of companies loosely connected. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why we have a very good fit between uh, uh, blockchain and supply chain. And we have to get to a certain level of digitalization of the companies and the people in the supply chain just to, to, mm -hmm. to get it going. Uh, but when we have that and, and we see, we see a, a that the, that the digitalization speed is is getting quicker and quicker. More and more companies are understand that they they have to digitalize digitalize and and get more automated. But as soon as we have more uh, digital tools, like just to to report things, to have transport documents, uh, electronic forms, and so on, and when we can put that in the blockchain, when we have that then we can start implementing AI and, and machine learning on this to, uh, as Ben mm -hmm. said, to route around problems, but also to, to verify information for like, uh, from, for example, uh, IoT sensors and so on. So mm -hmm. when, when you get values like temperature and weights and locations and so on, now we can use uh, machine learning or, or AI to, to, to give that a, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a value on how accurate it is, uh, and it can also help us automate between companies. Uh, and, and here also we we get into the smart contract functionality of blockchain. So there is there is a lot of very very interesting things that that we can actually do with, with blockchain and AI together. Um, but yeah, that's uh, there is a lot of to talk about there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and 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 Ben, you know, when you envision uh, a solution being built, uh, you know, do would a blockchain and AI solution address any of the problems that have specifically been bought been brought about? Excuse me, by by COVID nineteen, or is this something you know that we sort of need to rethink on a broader level outside of just these moments of crisis? Well, clearly, this is something we need to rethink on a broader mm -hmm. level outside. Of, of crisis, but I would say that yeah. this situation, in in a way, it's analogous to what you see with nursing homes or healthcare systems. Like if 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 these systems were operating like they should be, or like many people would think they're operating, if they were well designed <laughs> and efficient, modern, and and digital now, then coping with the crisis wouldn't have been such an insanely bad problem as, as it yeah, has been. Exactly. I mean, if, if you had decent health practices within every nursing home, then yeah, you wouldn't have COVID spreading like crazy inside nursing mm -hmm. homes. Like, on, on the other hand, probably a lot of other lives would be saved before the crisis that we just weren't, we just weren't paying attention to. If old people die very big they were going to die anyway, right? So 
in the supply chain, similarly, I mean, things were patched together, so they pretty much worked. You know, shipping a package might have taken twice as long as 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 it should have. Something might have cost a bit more than it should have, and the, there may have been some things broken. But in the end, things basically functioned, so we we weren't worried about all the problems inside the system. And that now, not now the weakness of the of the system as a whole is being is being exposed, right? And so, so yeah. I, I think one optimistic hope would be that a crisis like this serves as a sort of a wake-up call to modernize and, and upgrade various systems in a way that will promote general efficiency as well as make things more, more robust for the next crisis. I mean, whether, whether that will happen, uh, you know, r- remains to be seen. It's sort of a historical and anthropological question because i mean the, the thing thing with blockchain for supply chain as as he said it's 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 very very obvious right i mean that the most obvious strength of a blockchain solution is when you have multiple counterparties to transactions who are not fully trusted but they need to cooperate with each other. and you i mean you have that very exactly in in the in supply chain i mean you're passing stuff from what from one one Entity to another, to another, to another, and there's there's reasonable trust between the different parties in this supply chain, but they each have their own motives and and their own records. There's not there's not total trust, and it's also the case you don't have thousands of transactions every second, like in high frequency trading or something. So in a in a supply chain context, it, it it's it's okay that transactions on blockchains today are not as fast as inside MasterCard or something. Like the performance requirements are not the same as in, in fintech applications, which is what's been a big, big focus of, of, of the blockchain world. So I think that current technology can basically do it, and it actually solves an extremely glaring present problem, which is records are kept inconsistently and, and messily, not updated properly, and there's not really a coherent record of what's going on through through a whole supply chain in in, in, ma- in many cases. And it, right. why why isn't it rolled out? Well, because it's a really annoying rollout and and sales and things <laughs> that. And look at so look at something like shipping, which I've I've done some work with. I mean, you know, you, you've got people who come to get something. You've got people who manage it at a dock. People who load it onto a container ship. Then people in many, many different places who may take it off and, right. and move it somewhere else, keep it somewhere else, and then then bring it to the to wherever it's going. I mean that's you're not even there you're not even building something, you're just moving stuff. But even even with just moving stuff, there there, there can be a dozen or twenty different entities along 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 that route at various levels of development as, as businesses. And you've got to get them all to buy in. To some blockchain solution or some collection of interoperable blockchain solutions. So then, when you when you add into it, look at our, our Sophia humanoid robot. Like we we spent so much time just talking to motor companies about, okay, no one has a motor we want, so we have to store the gears inside the motor. And I mean, the number of, of different companies involved is is significant. Even if you're just moving things, let alone if you're building a robot or something. So it's it's right, one of these right. cases. Like once everyone has adopted it, you know everyone is is operating much more efficiently in the normal course of business, as well as being much more resilient in the in the face of a crisis. But getting getting widespread adoption of something is a is a, an interesting interesting challenge. And uh, it's definitely an interesting challenge. And and Stefan, I want to ask you, uh, you know, a little bit about how. Uh, how you've uh, seen this implemented in in practical ways, you know, it is as 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 Ben said, you know, very eloquently that this is going to be uh, a difficult and, and very sort of annoying <laughs> problem. Uh, how do we make this work on a practical level? You know, within the next even twelve months, twelve to twenty four months. Yeah, right. We we are actually working on it right now. Uh, I would like to address a couple of points that, that Ben pointed out here, mm. that it's not a, as many uh, transactions as financial industry. Um, I'm not sure about that because there is a lot of transactions. Uh, if a machine is producing uh, 
10,000 pr products per, per, per minute, uh, like that, it's, it's not as high as high frequency trading, but it's still like uh, tens, uh, ten of thousands of hundreds of thousand transactions per second. So, uh, and you, you must use a blockchain that can actually handle that. And that is, that is what is available uh, today and what we are using. Uh, many people think that, that blockchains are slow and so on, and many companies think that, that you need a, a private blockchain to have security, but th that's, not, that's not simply not true. So mm -hmm. what we need uh, is, is one global public blockchain that everybody can use and that has the scalability and capability of hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, and that's actually mm -hmm. what we have now. And what we are working on and other companies are working on as well is, is to make it very, very easy for company to start using blockchain that company shouldn't have to, to learn about blockchain. Just like company, all companies today are, are using internet for communication, mm -hmm. even sensitive information to your bank and to, to your suppliers and customers and so on, are going on, on the public internet, but everything is encrypted. We do the same with an, uh, with an open public blockchain that we are communicating with the open public blockchain, but everything is encrypted and secure. And just like company today, they don't have to learn everything about TCP IP protocol, HTTP and so on to, 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 to uh, use internet. They just use it via a browser and a, and a service provider. We are trying to do the same thing for, for blockchain here, that companies should just continue using their current ERP system, their current business processes, like creating an order or, or a, a bill of lading, they should just do that like they are doing it today, but in the back end, it should go through, to, through blockchain instead. Uh, and mm -hmm. then you lower the threshold for company to start using the, this new technology. Right. And you, at the same time, you make it much more secure because when you're using blockchain encrypting things, everything is secure traceable and, and, and immutable and, and that's the that's the strength about an open public blockchain uh, yeah yeah that, that... sure no no continue yeah. okay. so <laughs> what what we what we should do is to simply provide this functionality to companies to start using it and thanks I should say thanks to this uh, situation we have now is that a lot of customer has gotten this wake up bell that, whoa, we have to be prepared. We, we everything was too loosely uh, coupled here and, and too much manual work. So they are actually, the customers we are talking to is, is, is very interested in, in start looking into this and start actually using <coughs> this blockchain technology for, Right, like in, in, right. uh, in, this, in the food supply chain, where we have to keep track of, of uh, temperatures and, and uh, uh, or origin of products and, and the traveling route of products and so on, and that they are healthy. And we also see a lot of more people now, also thanks to, to the situation that more people are more interested in, in what's actually inside of their product. What, what are right, all their Right, exactly. Ingredients? All their gluten, yeah, that, that all their, so all their lactose, and so on, all their soya, soya products, and so on, mm -hmm. or, or uh, all of these things. Uh, yes. So, so we see a risk. So fun. I'm, I'm of terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry to cut you off. Unfortunately, uh, Ben and Stefan, we are out of time. Uh, I think we could go on all day. I'm so interested in, in this topic. Uh, I want to thank you both so much for your time and also thank you, our audience, uh, for, for spending this time with us. I wish you all the best. Uh, there's a lot happening in the world right now. Stay safe and stay well. A huge thank you to Rachel from Finance Magnets there for a fantastic moderated panel. It was great to see how AI in the US from Ben's perspective and also a blockchain in Europe from Stefan's perspective is changing and evolving in 2020. We've had some great comments come through on Facebook and YouTube. So thank you to everyone that has been interacting with us. I'm going to read out a few that we have. So we've had Christina who said great points. Thank you. Very needed integrated wholesome approach. We've had great speech from Brock Pierce. 
Johnny Kong has said excellent speech, I love it, and Jan has said great. Guys, thank you so much for all of your interaction. But if you are watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or our website, do go over to our swap card platform where you can interact and also take part in some polls to see where the emerging tech industry is growing. Now we do have the results from our previous poll just in. We asked you all which emerging tech will most impact future supply chains. And the results were 41% voted that AI would most impact the industry. We had 14% for IoT, blockchain and autonomous vehicles, 9% for quantum computing and 9% for big data. So keep an eye out for any future polls that we have. Now we're going to see what our next discussion is focusing on data in the world of COVID-19 and aftermath. Let's take a look. Dark side of data. Is COVID-19 the slippery slope to illicit activity? With Carla Denise Frias, Managing Partner at Baylaw Group. Matthew Sherry, Associate Director of Digital Solutions at KPMG and Taha Saeed, Chief Blockchain Consultant at Limar Global Technology. Well, in a modern world, data is one of the most valuable assets that we can have. So we have a fantastic panel joining us now. We have Carla, who's a managing partner at a law firm focused on technology law and is also a criminal law professor at one of the leading law schools in the Philippines. We have Matthew Sherry, who is technology specialist at KPMG, particular focus on emerging technologies like blockchain and AI, and also Taha, who is helping enterprises in digital transformations really drive, build, and innovate solutions. So it's it's fantastic to have you all join me today on the line. Thank you so much. Nice Thank to you be for here, having us. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Tal. Thank you for having us. Yes. You're very welcome. Hi, Matthew. Now, I want to jump in and start with talking about data confidentiality because in the past three to four months, we've seen a complete paradigm shift. COVID-19 has really shaken up multiple number of sectors and we have had to see this move digital for a lot of companies and industries that maybe were slightly unprepared. I want to start just by asking, and I'll start with you, Carla, from your perspective, what kind of things did we see that maybe didn't perform as it should, maybe security or data breaches in light of COVID-19 that was negative for the sector? I think as far as this pandemic was concerned, and I'm going to speak uh, with the Philippine setting in mind, um, we weren't as digitalized as other countries. So the concept of working at home was something that was close to being alien to most of the Philippine companies here. That's why most of the time it was their own personal devices that they were using. And given that, all the security protocols that their companies had didn't necessarily apply to these. And that's just the beginning of the mountain of problems that happened. Um, one more thing also is that as compared to Europe, even though we do have our own data privacy law, it's not as, well, I would hesitate to say that it's not taken as seriously, but I would have to say that that's the case. And uh, so a lot of people here don't even think that the GDPR applies to the Philippines. And all of us here know that that's not the case, right? So I think it's more of the lack of preparation and information about the threats that are actually happening. And it caused um, some problems, I would say, but it is a good learning experience for everyone. Definitely need to onboard a lot of information very quickly to be able to adapt. So Carla's given us the Philippine right. perspective there. Matthew, I want to turn to you from, from the European perspective, as you are based here in Malta. How did you view the situation? Yeah, I think I think in Malta we're we're very well set from an infrastructural perspective at least. I mean, and even the digitization of services, we've had you know, even if you look at the government, for example, we've had um, they've been digitized for quite a number of years already now. Um, but I think I also draw parallels with what Carla was mentioning in the sense that I feel like education is still always the number one problem and the number one issue uh, issue here. I think we've seen a number of um, we've seen a number of issues arise in, in the fact that people were essentially panicked when this when this struck. You know, there were a number of organizations that weren't that actually weren't very well prepared, even if they had the technology and they had the investment in place, they weren't necessarily very well prepared to actually shift at a short moment's notice onto, onto this. So what did we see? We saw organizations that were trialing different um, online um, collaboration platforms, um, left, right, and center, without actually knowing the implications of using one, one over the other. And that's, 
all of these actually create attack vectors to, to, to malicious attackers and they actually play right in their right into their right into their sort of um, you know uh, trap um, uh, so to speak so yeah I think I think there were as Carla said as well it was it, it was and I feel like it still is a, a massive learning experience for everyone um, not just um, not not just the technology industry um, itself um, I think I think industries across the board where you know, it's like we're always talking about disruption and embracing disruption. All of a sudden, you have no other option. It's it's either embrace disruption or else you know you're gone uh, for good. Um, and I think when faced with that, when faced with that, um, with that fate, a lot of a lot of uh, organizations said, okay, we might as well embrace disruption to see to see what we can make out of this. At least that's what I felt. You know, the sort of European perspective um, was, but there's still a lot of there was still a lot of panic and, and unpreparedness, I felt. And I'm sure some industries even created solutions that maybe surprised themselves in the sector that they were working in. Taha, I want to turn to you now and just ask, are you able to give us any examples? There were some real security breaches that we saw in the past few months that even hit headlines that were sheer magnitude of just how this, uh, this COVID-19 situation has forced people to move online. Are there any that you're able to explain to our viewers? Yes, exactly. Uh, so first of all, I would like to tell you know most companies uh, are not able to figure out uh, what GDPR actually is and what is the consequences of the breach. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so now they are once once because now we are seeing over in this digital age, uh, companies are moving towards digital transformation. So there are more attack surfaces which are being opened, and there are more devices. Let's say like you know before we were not talking about IP devices and IP address and handset devices which are. Which comes under G, uh, which comes under GDPR, you know. So now, once we are embracing real transformation, there are more metrics uh, which can be comprised. Uh, as GDPR, so what we are seeing, you know, we have seen the famous Zoom that we are, you know, using that, you know, it comes under attack. Uh, you know, uh, they were not, you know, having adequate security measures we should do, to, which they should be having it. So which resulted in, you know, security breach, and then we can. We have seen, you know, uh, we have seen many healthcare companies uh, which are experiencing the data breach or protected health information. You know, uh, so they are also, and and if you're talking about airlines as well, we have seen EasyJet airlines, uh, which you know, which cannot be able to protect their customers. You know, uh, and once they and. and the issue is that you know once companies uh, once companies able to understand the attack vectors uh, they don't know that what are the consequences of this breach you know uh, so let's say you know people uh, who'll be watching is if i if i'll tell you you know the breach of this gdpr you know if not if you're not been able to comply with this, you can lose four percent of your global revenue you know uh, so you have to take proper measures you know safeguarding it yeah and what what's really shocking about this you mentioned the healthcare systems easyjet where customers information there is pretty much all of their valuable information and data so these are huge industries huge sectors you would expect them to be better prepared so I'll ask this to the group and anyone is, is free to answer was anyone surprised at the the industries that we did see that were, were, were hit from these data breaches was there any um, feeling that they should have been better prepared honestly I'm sorry if I jump in I, I really wasn't that surprised because just because an industry is big doesn't necessarily mean that they have the proper protocols that they are supposed to have. I think the major problem with a lot of um, companies, especially if they feel that they have some sense of cybersecurity, they, I think the wrong thing about it is they assume that if all protocols are in, into place, a cybersecurity threat or hack will never happen. And I think the better attitude would be to assume that it'll happen at one point in time rather than think that, no, it will never happen to us. Just assume that it'll happen. That way, you'd be able to evolve whatever security protocols you have. So I don't necessarily equate a big industry uh, with respect to having the same or the great security protocols. It could happen to anyone. You'd be surprised to know that bigger industries sometimes are the most lax simply because they think that they have everything that's necessary in order for them to operate. Yeah, I so you go ahead. I, I, I actually dare say it's it's the other way around. I think it's easier for startups and for smaller organizations to be agile and nimble and to be able to adapt uh, to this new rea reality. Whereas in larger right. industries, often the policies and the mechanisms you have in place um, don't allow you to actually move quickly. Um, and I feel like that's that's what we that's what we actually you know that's what we actually saw um, play out um, because 
if you're talking about the, the big organizations, even companies like, for example, you know, Microsoft, who had, uh, who I think did a good job because they actually had a platform, Microsoft Teams, for example, which, which they pushed for. Uh, and, and this was the right opportunity for them to actually showcase it. But they, even there, you know, they actually ended up in a, in a situation where they realized that there were certain limitations that they had on their, on their backlog that they actually all of a sudden needed to prioritize. Whereas if you look at smaller organizations, like, for example, Zoom, all of a sudden it shot up because it was, it was able to check out features much, much faster. Never mind the issues that were, you know, th right. that were underlying the different technologies, because at the end of the day, um, one was able to adapt much more quickly than, than the other. At least that's what I feel like. But that's, I think that's, that's natural in, in, in big organizations vis-a-vis -vis versus smaller organizations, at least. That, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. I think it's, it's quite normal. And if we look at the situation now moving forward, and, and Taha, I'll start with you here. What kind of uh, procedures then can be put in place? Because uh, I'm sure everyone could agree that we hope a situation like this doesn't happen again, but there has been lessons that have been learned. So are there some key takeaways that uh, small to medium-sized enterprises that are looking to ensure that their data safety is secure, what steps can they take? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, so yeah, actually, Okay, first, we need to understand about uh, what it means to have a secure system and what it means to you know protect your security. Because imagine that if you are a digital transformation company and you are making billion dollars a year, you know, and if there's a lawsuit which you can have it in in form of non-compliance or somebody can use your use your network to attack somebody else, it can cause you know huge damage to your to your, to your enterprise. You know, so 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 first of all, we need to consider security which is design which is by design okay rather than uh, okay, rather than an afterthought you know practice so that's what you know you have to uh, develop a security culture you know and then uh, we say that you know uh, no design can be 100 percent secure okay so you have to do your due care and due diligence and you should be considering security as a continuous process you know uh, so you can do something like vulnerability assessment or vulnerability analysis uh, vulnerability analysis in which you can measure like you know uh, you can perform the gap assessment of your nodes and then you can see that where are you lacking and and you have to also make in place like you know what sort of uh, data you are saving so let's say that once you are developing the culture you are you know uh, doing some gap some exercise then you, you do need to have the classification of data that what sort of data is is more crucial to you you know what sort of data you 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 cannot compromise on and then you have to place adequate security tools to protect that data so that's some of the main techniques Thank you. And Carla, I want to turn to you now and just ask you, so is there anything that I'm sure you're asking, you had a lot of clients that were potentially asking for advice during these uncharted waters mm -hmm. uh, over the past few months. Was there any advice that you were able to give to them just to ensure that they were uh, keeping secure and as safe as possible? You know, my advice to my clients was fairly simple because at the end of the day, you have to start with being able to do the simple things. The problem here was that people didn't have enough information. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. They didn't know what they weren't supposed to do. So it was one thing to actually tell them what they're supposed to do, but I kept emphasizing, write it down, have a list of what you guys are allowed to do with the data and what you guys aren't allowed to do. Get rid of that hierarchy where, um, let's say staff employees feel that they can't approach the data protection officer immediately in case they have questions. So I was telling them, in case of doubt, ask questions because that's the only way for people to be able to prevent a problem from happening. Most of the time it's because people, you know, try to wing it simply because they weren't properly informed. So that was, uh, there were a lot of advice that I gave, to be honest, there was virtualization, there was making sure that, you know, your data was backed up and I was telling them, you know what, you, you so like the cloud, you say that you use Amazon Web Services and then you put it in Google in the same region, why not put it in another region just in case one region shuts down. Those kind of things. But for me, um, as a technology lawyer, since you know I'm not a developer or anything like that, I was telling them you have to train the people. They have to make this a habit. It has to be a culture. Because even if you bombard them with so many technical terms, if they do not understand what these mean, then nothing will come out of it. And as uh, what Matthew said earlier on, um, it is a learning experience for everyone. 
And in the same manner that it is a learning experience, it is also the responsibility of the business owners to actually teach. Learn, the business owners should learn and they should in turn teach these to their employees if we want to be able to cope with the changing times. A lot of people say that, you know what, let's disrupt, let's do this. As what Matthew said as well, it's so easy to talk, but to actually apply it is a different thing altogether. And, and you're right, Matthew, you said something really interesting earlier on, which was that the larger corporations, it might actually be more difficult for them to implement stable structures and processes because they are less agile than these smaller companies. And if we look at things moving forward, in the past three to four years, technology has increased and advanced massively. We've seen things that would not have been possible. How are companies able to continue to be agile as this industry does grow? If we look at things moving forward, what kind of sectors could pose to be a real threat to corporations? What kind of technology as well? I don't think there's one. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here, um, Jessica. Um, I don't think there's actually one specific industry or sector because I think each and every sector is, is, is open to disruption and open to getting disrupted. And I feel like that's that's often when the when the biggest and and most you know and and when the loudest um, disruptive um, forces take place. Actually, it's when you have industries that think that they can't get disrupted, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, like you know, if if I go back quite a few years now to to come up to to show an example that um, um, that's been in place, and I, I think that everyone is, is sort of familiar with. The hospitality industry didn't feel like it could be disrupted right. with technology, but then Airbnb came along, and all of a sudden, you know, things started changing. They started asking for certain regulation, um, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, this this actually can happen across the board. What I feel like is something that a pandemic essentially um, will propel forward is disruption in the healthcare industry, um, and right. potentially even in the in the in the tourism industry now, given that. You know, essentially, there's been a reset switch pressed on on this industry, um, and uh, even a lot of very big and established players, um, essentially, are either on their back foot or are starting almost from, in some cases, starting from zero is actually the best you can hope for at this point. Um, this, I feel, like creates an environment where where you know this sort of disruption with innovative um, companies that can actually apply technology. Um, in a manner that actually, you know, drives real value rather than just for fluff, um, as I like to say, is, is, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of that. And personally speaking, as a technologist, as a, as a, as a geek, <laughs> I'm quite excited for that. I, and, and I'm quite keen to see, to see what, what we're going to, what we're going to um, you know, have in five years from now. So if we take the technology sector as an example, because it's a fantastic example, especially when we look at how valuable people's data is, healthcare records is something where I'm sure people would really like to see more investments when it comes to ensuring that those records are kept secure. What kind of technology would you expect to see automated or put on a blockchain? What kind of um, aspects of the healthcare system would you expect to see revamped based on what you understand from the tech sector? Let, 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 I'll, I'll try to be quick and brief. I think when sure, we're talking man. about technologies such as, such as blockchain, um, something like this has actually showed that it's important for different players to be, to be cooperating with one another. Um, so I think that is where technology, technology so far has been very, very much siloed. And I do think that something like blockchain can actually create the environment where these different organizations can actually effectively interact with with one another um, and in a secure way. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, sorry, Carla. No, no problem. For the Philippines, um, as I've said, we are, and uh, especially in the healthcare industry, there are a lot of areas wherein technology could play such a crucial role. Just telemedicine, just being able to do like online appointments. It's as simple as that. So honestly, I am excited for the healthcare industry here in the Philippines because something like this pandemic certainly open people's eyes to see how technology can actually make things so much faster, so much safer, and so much convenient for everyone. Fantastic. And now, Tab, yeah, over here. Yeah. Tab yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, with this, uh, in, the, in the blockchain, if we are using, but we should also be, you know, uh, we also be careful that uh, with the use of technology, we should not be, you know, breaching the data. 
Okay, let's say that if you are, you know, doing some authentic authentication mechanism by uh, using customer data, you should, you know, saving it in the form of encryption, you know, or you will be saving the personal data on offline storage uh, while using blockchain, you know. So that's uh, okay, two things very important. And I see that, you know, uh, within blockchain in the healthcare industry, supply chain is is one domain in which we can, you know, have the tracing combat, uh, which, which in which we can have the tracing end to end. And we should be making sure that if you are uh, having the tracing or uh, or once you you know uh, having the data and transfer, it should be encrypted end to end. It's not be it's not and we and we should be able to cover all the all the touch points of the data. So that's two, three areas. Great, thank you. And now I do want to kind of turn this onto a, a positive ending note. If we look at uh, the technology that we've been discussing today and the fantastic potential that it does hold to future shape uh, numerous sectors, not just the tech sector, but, but every single industry uh, alone. Uh, if we look at the, the pandemic that we've seen, if this was to happen in two to three years time, how would emerging technology, how would this play a better role in making the situation easier for these individual sectors? Is there certain things that we would expect to see that would have played a more prominent role, be it quantum computing, be it blockchain, would it be AI automation? Uh, Matthew, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think I'm not sure about the timeline. So uh, I genuinely hope this doesn't happen again in, with, within the next five years, at least. Um, but I think um, once quantum computing becomes, for example, a lot more prevalent within the within the medical research industry, I think that in and of itself is going to help us discover vaccines much, much, much quicker um, and, and in a much more, you know, in a much more in a safer way and in a, in, in a much more um, agile way as well. Um, and I feel like something like that will actually, you know, at the end of the day, that is the sort of um, globally understood um, end to this whole to this whole um, predicament. Um, but I think even if we draw parallels between this pandemic and previous pandemics, the fact that we had technology so sort of indecorated within the fabric of organizations, it already, even if we're talking about all the problems that were faced, it actually allowed a number of industries to at least keep trundling along. Um, so I genuinely think that, you know, if something like this happens again, or rather when something like this happens again in the future, um, we will be able to adapt to it with the with the advancements in technology in a much, much weaker way. I just hope, um, I just genuinely hope that uh, certain lessons that we've learned, not necessarily from a technological perspective, but more from a humanity perspective during this pandemic and even during previous pandemics, we'll actually, you know, not forget them and we'll repeat the same mistakes. Um, that's that's uh, because sometimes, you know, sometimes I fear that that's that's what we're programmed to do as, as humans, unfortunately. Absolutely. And also the fact that everyone was at home, locked in their own environment, it meant right. that it was really in people's faces. They couldn't ignore the situation that they were in. Carla, I want to ask if you have anything to add to Matthew's points, if you agree or what's your thoughts? Uh, I would definitely have to agree with what Matthew was saying and just this thing that we're doing. If, and hopefully not, a pandemic again happens, the fact that people are now so used to video conferencing, using different platforms to be able to do things that everyone thought one had to actually be present for, that in itself eliminates, you know, a probability of infection and contamination. So I guess it's not really the timeline is what Matthew was saying, because technology will always be there. It's always developing. There will always be new situations. And everything that we're experiencing now is adding to the preparedness that we will have if ever that happens again. Because imagine if this happened years ago when there was no internet, right? It would have been different, definitely. So, I mean, that's all that I can say about that. But at the end of the day, hopefully something like this can be avoided. And Carla, just to add on to that, are you also expecting that from a compliance perspective that we are going to see more legal processes that are in place so that uh, information is stored differently so that as companies are working from home with uh, valuable information are we going to see different regulations come into place surrounding surrounding data oh for sure because even now we are now allowed to actually send things via email to the court and of course attorney client privilege everything um the data isn't supposed to be you know disclosed to anyone else a lot of law firms here are now doing their best to be compliant because it's not just Asia that 
we have to be dealing with. It's not just the Philippine Data Privacy Act. It's the fact that there's the GDPR, there's the PDPA, there are so many laws. And now it's highlighted because everyone is suddenly on their computers storing data. Even meetings are being conducted over the computer, over the telephone, or over the mobile phones. So it's a different thing altogether. And I am expecting the Privacy Commission here in the Philippines to be much more active when it comes to you know, making sure that everything is appropriate or is proper. Fantastic. Well, it was great to hear from you all. Thank you three so much for sharing your insights today. It was an absolute pleasure to get you all on the line from your respective com uh, countries and, and share your insights as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, 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 Matthew. Thanks, Taha. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. So our next presentation that we're going to bring to you is something a little bit different and a little bit interesting. We have a very short and dynamic presentation focusing on the startups across the Asia region. As you know, if you are familiar with our AIBC summit events, we always invest time and energy into our startups. At each conference, whether it's Malta or Manila for future events, we always host a startup pitch where we give free booths to over 100 startups across the emerging tech and AI space across the world. And out of those, 10 get to deliver their presentation on stage to a series of investors and they can win a prize which will help elevate them into the next level of success. Well, as we couldn't do that digitally, we have a presentation on how to crowdfund and raise capital across Asia. So let's take a look. How to raise capital and crowdfund across Asia. With Mansur Madhavi, partner at Blockchain Founders Fund. Hello everyone, thank you for coming out and listening to this talk. We're in for an exciting conference here in the Philippines um, and today we'll be talking about growth hacking your blockchain startup and securing your first POC. So first thing I want to do is cover things that startups do wrong. So number one, focusing on sales instead of product validation. So if you don't know the target customer has such a problem, and cares about finding a solution, why would they buy it? The second problem is allocating a large budget to advertising before understanding the customer or experimenting with micro campaigns. Then the third is focusing on scaling before achieving product market fit. It's important to build feedback loops and iterate based on customer needs. So one example I wanna give is on Tesla. So when Elon Musk was building Tesla, he didn't necessarily need to get validation for an electric vehicle. Like vehicles had been made before, manufactured before, people are using them. But what he essentially needed to solve was the battery. And the riskiest assumption he had there is that he could make the battery work. And so he had to go through a process of testing and validating that. So the next thing I wanna to go to is the startup curve. So this is something that was presented by Paul Graham, who is the uh, founder of Y Combinator. So, you know, before a startup, you know, you launch it, there's some initial enthusiasm, but very quickly, reality sets in and you're in this trough of sorrow where you're continuously testing hypotheses, experimenting, pivoting until something starts working. At, at which point, that's when you start, you know, adjusting your MVP and trying to find some product market fit. And once you have some success there, then you're off to the races and it's a scaling game. But until that point, you're very much testing, pivoting, figuring out what the customer needs until you can get to that product market fit. So why do I need a POC? So the reason 90% of startups fail is because they do not create products with a value proposition that solves actual problems. So the main thing to ask yourself is, does anyone care? And uh, testing is done um, so that you can fail fast and iterate quickly. There's multiple ways to go about a POC, but one of the things we wanna do in, in that whole process is test that biggest assumption. So similar to giving that Tesla example before, you need to determine what the riskiest assumption is, uh, the one that has the least amount of data and that's of key importance to the viability of the concept. Determine how to test that riskiest assumption. And so, um, I gave you that example of Tesla, that, that's a perfect example of something that was the biggest risk to Elon Musk's business, and that's the problem he went out for solving. So one of the things that a lot of startups do wrong is they figure out what their product is and then try to determine 
which customer it solves a problem for or who their customer is. And that's usually the wrong approach. Like essentially you wanna be customer centric and figure out what problem for which customer you're trying to solve and then come up with a tailored solution that fits their needs. So how can we you know, get this validation? And so we can do it through secondary data, you know, researching online forums, Reddit, you know, Google, uh, press releases, things like that. Uh, we can do through primary sources such as customer interviews, Quora, Typeform, things like that. Um, or using micro ad campaigns, you know, using Facebook, LinkedIn, we can learn a lot about the customers with small budgets and testing a lot of different audience segments. And then finally, prototyping and wireframing. And that's another way to work through the process flows and show your product to your end customer. So hacking your MVP. This is one of the key things here in terms of how to get a you know MVP out very quickly and easily. Uh, single feature MVP, generally you're testing low tech and only the core features. Again, the thing here is you don't need to build out the you know, first version of your product, you're essentially testing just the core feature, the one reason that people would use your product over anything else. Um, the second way is a concierge MVP, and that's where you manually, you know, solve the problem for your customer, where you're then determining if a digital solution is needed. And then finally, uh, oh, sorry, there's a couple more. Uh, Wizard of Oz. So that's essentially where you build an interface without any features and you're tracking whether people are clicking on different buttons to identify if there's a demand. And then finally, a piecemeal MVP. And that's where you're you know, consolidating a few different existing products to serve your customer's current need. And then based on that, you can determine if you need um, an all-encompassing solution. So be simple, be brutally honest, be systematic. Learn from other people's mistakes. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Feel free to reach out and contact me via WeChat or save my QR code. Um, thank you, thank you for listening and thank you for being at the event. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I hope you guys learned a lot through our session of Emerging Tech Update, what has been built so far in 2020. Now